Okay, thank you very much. I just shared my screen. Is it up okay? No, we cannot see it. Hit the share button there, Dale. Oh, I did, I thought. Uh, can you see it now? No. Not yet. Not, not, not yet. Can't understand what the uh, problem is here. When, I, when you hit the share screen, you have to highlight what you're going to present. You have to click yeah, on it. Yeah, I did. There we go. Oh, I, I had looked like I had to clip. So I, so I apologize for that. Okay. Well, uh, I'm very honored, indeed, uh, humbled to be able to participate in this uh, 2021 RCA Technology Symposium. And I'm especially honored to be among so many great people in the world of radio communications. I must say that all the talks were incredible this morning. I really uh, enjoyed all. And of course, uh, I can't help but saying that uh, Audrey McElroy is a really a hard act to uh, follow, but I'll try. I have entitled my remarks, Current Issues Inspector Management, which I, as I will explain later, is a touch misleading. Uh, Uh, here is an outline of what I intend to cover. I'll start with an introduction, purpose, and acknowledgments. I'll give a brief spectrum management tutorial, and then I'll talk about current level, high level issues in the management of the radio spectrum resource. And then if we have time, maybe to touch a little bit on the future of the radio amateur service. So when I began uh, drafting these remarks, I thought I would start by reminiscing about my early days in radio that go back to the early to mid 1950s. Uh, that was back when uh, uh, a, a land mobile radio took up much of the trunk of the car, the Lee Neville alternator took a much of, of, up much of the engine compartment to power it and the control head took up uh, a lot of red room in the car itself. Gosh. B, my pride and joy was a homebrew three-stage amateur ham radio transmitter with, as I recall, a 6AG7 driving a 6L6, driving a pair of 807 tubes in push-pull. Uh, th those were the days. And if we were meeting in person, I would certainly enjoy having one of those brown 807s with you all. I had intended to relate some of the history to what we are experiencing today technology-wise, but I was worried about time. Uh, similarly, I thought I might talk about the exponential growth and demand for access to the radio spectrum by government, commercial and private, and scientific users, but you can hardly pick up a business or trade publication or even the popular press without reading a story about that demand and the billions of dollars that have been and that have been and are being paid for the wireless resource. So I incited instead to start by talking about spectrum management in a more formal sense to level set, if you will. So we have a common basis for discussing some of the overarching issues in the field. Uh, before I go on, I want to acknowledge the help of several of my colleagues, Pierre de Vries, uh, Peter Tanhula, who just retired from NTIA, Keith Grumbin, and David Reed, uh, among many others. However, uh, the views expressed in this presentation are, are my own, entirely my own, and independent of any organization with which I am affiliated. So now uh, I'd like to turn to a brief spectrum manage, uh, management tent, brief spectrum management tutorial. And it's old hat for, of course, for many of you, for many, if not most of you. Uh, 
for those who have taught others about uh, how radio works, either formally or informally, it really is tough, intimidating job, especially when your audience is composed of lay people, like people on Capitol Hill. It is where you usually have to start the instruction, though. And on the slide are the words of no other than Albert Einstein, who reputedly said, you see, wire telegraph is a kind of a very, very long cat. You pull its tail in New York and his head is meowing in Los Angeles. Do you understand this? And radio operates exactly the same way. You send signals here and receive them there. The only difference is that there is no cat. Well, that's not a very uh, satisfying answer, of course. Let's try to do a little bit better. But before I do so, I should hasten to say that this quote I am, that in this, by using this quote, I am not condoning cruelty to animals. That was a thought experiment only. So, uh, what is, so what is spectrum? Well, spectrum is a conceptual tool used to organize and map a set of physical phenomena. It's a conceptual tool. It's not something in a physical sense, as Einstein, as Einstein indicated. Of course, electric and magnetic waves produce, electric and magnetic fields produce electromagnetic waves that move through space at different frequencies or equivalently at different wavelengths in the set of all possible frequencies are called the elect it's called the electromagnetic spectrum. The subset of frequencies between 3000 hertz and 300 gigahertz is known as the radio spectrum. Note that radio waves do not require a medium per se. Uh, they propagate perfectly well in outer space. That is, there's no uh, radio requires no medium as opposed to sound waves or ocean waves. The diagram at the bottom shows forms of electromagnetic uh, radiation. Radio spectrum, the orange block on the diagram, is a subset of all electromagnetic spectrum. Above the radio spectrum is infrared radiation or spectrum. Above that is a visible light range. Above that is ultraviolet radiation or spectrum. And of course, here in Colorado, we respect that a lot because when we're up high in the mountains, the uh, uh, ultraviolet uh, rays can cause uh, rather uh, severe uh, sunburn. And of course, above that is X-ray radiation, all familiar to all of us in medical applications. And above that are gamma rays and cosmic rays in turn. But our focus here is on radio waves, electromagnetic waves from three kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. Of course, in spectrum management, a frequency is a specific location on the electromagnetic spectrum expressed as a number of cycles per second or hertz. Analog bandwidth is the range of two frequencies and is also measured in hertz. Just as electric magnetic spectrum is divided into bands, radio, infrared, ultraviolet, and so forth, radio spectrum is further divided by spectrum management managers into subbands that are used for different purposes. For example, a cellular operator may transmit signals between 824 and 849 megahertz for a total of bandwidth of 25 megahertz in a band that is allocated to cellular radio systems. Uh, the uh, 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 next slide here is really highly, uh, uh, highly idealized, but it's uh, at the top in the yellow, of course, we, uh, there's arrayed the uh, uh, in yellow are, are the same uh, ranges of electromagnetic spectrum that uh, we discussed a moment ago. The red sine waves below illustrate that as one goes up in frequency, the number of cycles per second increases, no surprise there. The distance between the peaks is the wavelength, 
And note that the frequency, the number of cycles per second goes up as the distance between peaks, the wavelengths become shorter. Of course, we all know there is a simple formula that allows one to convert between frequency and wavelength so that for convenience sake, it doesn't matter whether you specify a frequency or a uh, wavelength for a location in the spectrum. The bottom of the illustration just uh, conveys a sense of how long a wavelength is as one goes from radio spectrum up through gamma rays. Uh, the uh, uh, next slide here, of course, is uh, is the famous wall chart or uh, published chart that's published by NTIA that shows spectrum allocations for radio services in the U.S. Uh, I think this chart's rather amazing for what it conveys, but the the chart the chart extends from nine kilohertz in the upper left-hand corner to 300 gigahertz in the bottom right-hand corner. The colors in the chart indicate what services are what services are, are uh, what services are allowed in the particular in a particular frequency range or band. There are thirty colors arrayed along the left side, each corresponding to a different service. I know it's uh, kind of hard to read the chart, but the different services include things like the fixed satellite service broadcasting, amateur radio, land mobile radio, radio navigation services, and so forth. Now in the US, it's important to realize that the management of the spectrum resource is proportioned between NTI, which I ran uh, uh, on an acting basis at one point in my career, which is an executive branch agency, and the FCC, and independent regulate, uh, regulatory agencies whose powers are delegated uh, to it by the legislative branch or the Congress. Uh, in my last uh, role in government, I served as chief of the Office of Engineering and Technology uh, at the FCC between 1997 and 2000. Three additional colors are used on the chart to identify those portions of the spectrum that are managed exclusively by the FCC, exclusively by NTIA, and those portions that are managed jointly by the two agencies. Now, uh, I'm gonna make some uh, uh, observations about uh, uh, the chart. And uh, uh, one, it's awfully important. <laughs> it's awfully important to, uh, uh, realize, if you will, that the scale is logarithmic and not realizing that uh, can lead to misleading conclusions. Uh, for example, that first slide up there, uh, or the second slide says 300 to 300 megahertz, 300 hertz to 300 megahertz. And it would get lost. It would be invisible if you uh, plotted it down here in the uh, uh, seventh uh, row. And conversely, if you put the uh, 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 spectrum uh, uh, illustrated in the bottom and put it up to the top, of course, it would uh, it would totally uh, totally envelop it. Now, so. Uh, uh, the reason I point this out is, uh, especially with lay audiences, uh, uh, people get misled. They look and they see all the blue up here and they think that uh, most of the spectrum is allocated to broadcasting when it's uh, on a percentage basis, of course, it's not. Another thing that comes out that uh, important to discussion later is that the spectrum, radio spectrum is already shared. Uh, 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 if you look at if you look at the charts, you'll see here that there are multiple colors in different regions of the spectrum, and that means that the spectrum is shared between uh, uh, two or, or more or two or more service or services. Now, here, since this chart is published and it hangs around for uh, years, uh, uh, it, it can be misleading in in the sense that uh, that uh, uh, what we're illustrating here is static, is static sharing. 
and of course uh, uh, today I would I would argue uh, that, uh, uh, that perhaps the uh, uh, one of the biggest policy issues in spectrum management today is uh, is dynamic sharing. Uh, uh, literally, where you share spectrum. Uh, not over decades, but share it on a minute by minute, second by second, or even millisecond by millisecond basis. Uh, 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 you're share, like I say, shared on a moment by moment basis uh, and put to use. So, uh, as I said, uh, perhaps one of the single most important policy issues today is associated with dynamic rather than the static forms of sharing. <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, more about sharing. Uh, sharing, of course, can occur in two uh, in in uh, all three dimensions: frequency, space, and time. For example, two television stations can transmit at the same time in the same place but on different channels, so interference to a nearby receiver is avoided. And of course, that illustrates frequent uh, sharing in the frequency dimension. Uh, two TV stations can transmit at the same time on the same channel, but in different places, so interference is avoided because of the geographic separation. The signals generally weaken with distance. So here in my area where I live, uh, uh, it's possible to have a TV station in uh, Colorado Springs to my south, to the to my south, and a TV station in Cheyenne to my north. Uh, sharing, that's sharing, of course, in the geographic dimensions. Now, two stations can also uh, share in the time uh, uh, dimension. Uh, two stations can transmit at the same uh, location at the same uh, frequency on the same frequency or channel but at different times, so interference is avoided by time sharing. And of course, we're familiar with that with a technology called time division multiple access systems. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, another example are daytime only AM stations, which illustrate another time, a form of time sharing. Now, of course, it's important that inter there's interference spillover uh, in each events in each dimension. Radio signals don't behave as predicted and spill over in space. Transmitters are not perfect and spill radio energy into other channels in the frequency uh, dimension. They can't turn off a, trans a transmitter on and off uh, instantaneously. So there's spillover in the time domain and receivers aren't perfect, and they pick up signals not intended for them, a topic I will return to later. So inter interference management is the sine qua non of spectrum management, especially in the face of densification, multifarious wireless systems, and dynamic spectrum sharing I touched on a moment ago. Like death and taxes, noise and interference will always be with us and creates a practical constraint on our ability to extract more capacity from our supply of spectrum. Now, unless the possibility of some interference is accepted, no wireless communications can occur. The spectrum would have little or no value Total avoidance of interference is impractical and counterproductive. Managing interference is about managing risk. You hear some t people say sometimes, well, my service cannot tolerate any, any interference. And of course, uh, that's, that's uh, an impossible goal. Uh, there is always some risk of interference. In fact, my colleague, uh, uh, Pierre de Vries, has done a lot of work in what he calls risk-informed interference assessment, where you explicitly take into uh, 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 interference into account. 
that. So we're not talking about eliminating it totally. Now let's uh, uh, turn now to the four uh, basic steps in uh, inspector management. The basic steps as shown are the allocation step where ranges of radio spectrum are set aside for particular services. The service rule step is where regulations governing the use of different allocations are established. An example would be the maximum power that I can use on my transmitter or the amount of spillover uh, I am I'm, I am allowed, or an amateur service, which we talked a lot about. Of course, it would be the prohibition of doing something uh, for profit or on a commercial basis. That would be part of the service rules. Uh, the assignment step is where it is decided who gets access to the band under the conditions established by those service rules. So broadcasting, amateur radio operators, CMRS, and so forth that I touched on a moment ago. That's the assignment step. The fourth and final step involves the enforcement of the rules and regulations that have been established for the different bands and services. Rules are, are not so much, have not much use if they are not enforced. Spectrum enforcement is the focus of much of my current work, my current research at the University of Colorado here in Boulder. If you, uh, uh, at, here on this slide, I've listed the characteristics of different frequencies. Uh, again, this is familiar to many of you, I know. But uh, some of the factors uh, uh, vary with frequency. Yeah, for example, how fast the wave weakens with distance, the size of efficient antennas, the ability of the waves to penetrate buildings, the ability of the waves to penetrate through trees and other vegetation, the reflectivity the reflectivity of uh, the reflectivity of various objects to the waves, refractivity, the Doppler shift due to motion, and it, this all leads to the notion of uh, beachfront proc property. Because of this, uh, these desirable uh, characteristics, spectrum is crowded. It is truly. Uh, 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 it's illustrated by the fact that currently the FCC is uh, is auctioning some mid band spectrum, and the last I checked, it's drawn bids of more than twenty two billion uh, billion dollars. There are sources of spectrum, of course, beyond uh, uh, beyond uh, my next slide here. Of course, there are sources of interference and noise beyond spiller spillover from existing systems. A natural interference, intentional radio interference, such as radios, unintentional radiators, incidental radiators, and passive my, uh, uh, monitoring. But uh, 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 that uh, uh, we need to keep those sources in mind as, as I uh, go on. Uh, that uh, concludes my short tutorial, so I will offer a couple of key points or takeaways. Uh, first, that there are four basic steps in spectrum management, allocation, service rules, assignment, and enforcement. The management of interference is the essence of spectrum management. Spectrum is already shared, albeit on a mostly static basis. And the single biggest spectrum policy issues today surround dynamic spectrum sharing. And finally, mid-band spectrum, the spectrum 300 to up to perhaps six or eight gigahertz is particularly desirable. Now I'm going to shift uh, to the third part of my remarks and talk about current spectrum management issues. However, I'm not going to talk about specific FCC or NTIA or other agency proceedings. 
but rather what I consider to be high-level overarching issues that may not be fully appreciated by policymakers. Okay, let uh, uh, if I go to the next slide. There are two obvious, but not always fully appreciated facts about wireless. First of all, interference manifests, manifests itself in receivers and receiver performance is a key component, component in determining how efficiently we use the resource. Secondly, wireless networks are inherently open. Uh, while you can put uh, the receivers I just described inside a, a Faraday cage or a copper cage uh, to keep the bad guys out, to keep the interfering signals out, of course, you keep also out the desired signal. So uh, uh, it, that's obviously uh, self-defeating, hence the statement that wireless systems are inherently open at the physical or RF layer of the protocol stack. While obvious to most of you, the ramifications I find are, all, all, are not always fully appreciated by the policymakers in DC. Now let me turn to the implication of those two uh, of those two facts. First, uh, uh, I'm going to say be provocative here. Uh, radio transmitters and and uh, transmissions do not cause an in interference. An infinite number of transmitters or transit transmissions can be accommodated in space without interfering with one another. Uh, the radio signals pass right through each other in, in the ether and they, and they, don't, they don't bother each other. Or turning back to my Colorado, Wyoming example in the slide I used a while ago, a TVA station in Cheyenne transmits southward to Colorado Springs, and a TV station in the Springs transmits a signal northward. They don't collide with, collide with each other as they pass by. Rather, interference occurs when I install a receiver in, Den in Denver and try to watch the Cheyenne channel and get interference from Colorado Springs. Again, interference manifests itself in, uh, in, in, re in, re in receivers. Uh, now, one of the uh, 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 basic rules of good spectrum management is to avoid putting services with very high transmitter powers next to low power systems where there is bound to be technical problems at the band edge. And often adjacent services that have very uh, different mis missions, for example, public safety and commercial services, uh, if they're in the same sector, they kind of look at the world the same way. Uh, but if they're in different sectors, they can sometimes talk uh, by each other and, and uh, make it difficult to resolve uh, uh, interference issues. Let me uh, say a little bit in terms of receiver performance. Uh, think of uh, guard bands. If there is a strong signal in the next band over and it's hard for the receiver to reject or filter it out, you may have to employ guard bands, extra distance in the frequency dimension, and those bands can create unused wasted space. We have transmitter performance requirements, but not receiver requirements requirements in the service rules. But in any given situation, the receiver may be just as much at fault as the transmitters. But FCC does not, in general, does not regulate receiver performance. And if you're following sort of the day-to-day -day activities at the commission, you know that currently several issues at the commission involve questions of inadequate receiver performance. In short, we need to do something about uh, receivers who are going to use the spectrum uh, efficiently. The second, uh, uh, having dealt with receiver performance, I uh, will turn to the second uh, of the major high-level concern, and that is 
uh, the inherent openness of wireless. Unlike wired systems, such as those that are based upon fiber optic technology, wireless networks are inherently open to interference at the RF or physical layer. Hence, wireless systems are particularly susceptible to deliberate disruption from the following types of tacks, uh, jamming, spoofing, big data, and side channel, uh, five types of, uh, uh, five, uh, types of uh, disrup disruption. I could uh, go into more detail, but let me, uh, 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 and I can give you countless examples, but uh, let me mention just two. If, as you know, I probably know, you should know that the jamming and spoofing of GPS, GNS signals, whose signals are so critical to positioning, navigation, and timing are really occurring on a regular basis. And uh, so regular that, uh, you know, the military and so forth must uh, begin thinking about uh, 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 what to do about that criticality. Dale, you, you have two minutes. Oh, okay. I'll, let me, uh, I can, uh, I think I can get the gist of thing. Uh, here. Uh, 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 so uh, that's an example of what you can, bad things can happen. But let me uh, bring it a little closer to home. Uh, jamming and spoofing, there's jamming and spoofing of heart defibrillators and potentially pacemakers, neurostimulators, drug delivery systems, infusion pumps. And as an older person, uh, uh, obviously that can, uh, that uh, 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 concerns me a little bit. On my desk, I have an article entitled DS Reveals Some Heart Defibrillators Are Vulnerable to Hacking. So I've shown here an illustrated example where uh, interference and problems outages can occur over a wide range. And I can also, where hacking can uh, uh, disable at that level. I have some other uh, uh, issues or potential concerns, and I'll just read them and then I'll stop, uh, Jim. Uh, 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 the first is, is uh, the first is uh, increased complexity of wireless networks. Uh, the second is lack of quantitative definitions of harmful interference. The third is potential over reliance on common standards. The lessons from the Irish potato famine and potential difficulties in meeting very high levels of availability. Uh, 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 what did I, Jim? Why don't I, uh, why don't I, uh, Jim, I'm sorry. Uh, why don't okay. I stop there? I apologize for running over a little bit. No, uh, you, you're doing fine, Dale. Thank you so much for your presentation. And Margaret, uh, do you have some questions for Dale? Um, sure. Um, very interesting presentation and so many different areas I'd like you to go into more detail. Very curious about the Irish potato famine, but let's not go there right now. Um, trying to think about on the regulatory standpoint of that spectrum management, um, what can you comment on what I would call warehousing of licenses and spectrum versus legitimate state and local government like budget and project timelines? And, and go ahead and, and stop sharing there, Dale, if you would. Okay. How do I do that? Uh, should be up close to the top. No. Still, there we, there go. we go. You got it. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, respond to that about the warehousing issue. One uh, dynamic uh, uh, dynamic uh, sharing can help that. In other words, if you're warehousing, you're sitting on it, then I can come in with the right rules. I can come in and, and jump on it and use the spectrum when you're not uh, you're not using it. And uh, there's other things, economic incentives that you can give. Of course, use to give people the incentive uh, not to uh, not to squat on spectrum. Did I answer your question, Margaret? Um. Sure, I'm looking to stimulate discussion. Uh, some things, boy, if it was that easy to answer, they wouldn't be issues out there. Right, <laughs> right, right exactly. <laughs> well said. That one. Right? Well said. 
Um, I was curious that you you mentioned um, the importance of receivers in in that whole issue of interference. Um, very often, well, always, a license will give you a transmit limit, but they don't do anything to say, I'll call it limit the RF ears. I've seen systems, yes. I think they're improving things by taking their receive antennas and in VHF, putting them up at three, 400 feet for a town that's, you know, a couple miles around. And you say, well, that's maybe not a good idea. How would how would uh, regulatory bodies begin to regulate those kinds of issues? Because terrain impacts and other things like that. Yeah, let, let, me, uh, let me say, first of all, that if I want to leave one message, and that it's, it, and it message is, is that it's critical in the future to get mo maximum utilization of our spectrum resource, that we do something about receivers. Through, regula through regulation or incentives or whatever. So that's really, uh, really uh, a, 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 a key thing. And I'm afraid uh, in my old year, I lost your question. So I was so intent on, uh, so intent on making the point on receivers. Uh, uh, and uh, if you'd repeat just that last well, part. My, my point was, you know, I was gonna get to some more questions on receivers and I see some more out there. But not even just the receiver itself, but the whole system where, where people will think they're improving their system by putting their receive antenna yeah. much higher, thinking, oh, I'm making myself yes. have fewer ears, yes. uh, not thinking about all the unwanted signal they're getting. How that, would a regulatory body begin to address that? Well, uh, it, it uh, uh, you know, if uh, you get inter if you're getting interference and it's a poor receiver, uh, you don't necessarily want to take any uh, any any action. It's uh, it's uh, often would be up to you. Uh, for example, if you put a masthead amplifier on the top of your apartment building and you start getting interference, uh, you know the problem is uh, is in the manufacturer of the device not providing adequate filtering and so forth, and that leads back to uh, equipment approvals and so forth. I still feel like I'm dodging your question, and I don't mean to. That's okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we will not uh, put you like under the spotlights here. No, what, about, uh, what are the main concerns and challenges sharing the 3.1 to 3.4 gigahertz band? Yeah, uh, let me avoid, uh, let me avoid, uh, let me avoid commenting on specific proceedings that are, uh, you know, in front of the, uh, in front of the commission. But here, like, uh, here you again see issues of, uh, of, of how good the receivers are. Now, in a lot of cases, receivers are already out there. Or, or, uh, 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 the receivers are already out there, so you can't, you can't ignore them. But what we need to do, in my opinion, over time is have a program of continuously improving those receivers so that we can get maximum yield from the resource. All right. How about... Uh... Right now, we, we see a lot of transmitters and Wi-Fi routers at 2.4 that supposedly meet Part 15, but actually provide a lot of energy on the AM broadcast band. Yeah, here, uh, uh, here again, uh, the question is, are the, are the, uh, the Wi-Fi routers uh, splattering over into the, into the adjacent bands in violation of the rules? Or is the problem on the receiver side, where the receiver is not adequate to uh, reject interference that's being that's legal? In other words, uh, uh, that party is operating legally. One party is operating legally, and then the re uh, you still get the interference. That then, of course, uh, illustrates the receiver problem that I was emphasizing. Okay. Um trying to look at some of these other questions. Some people are trying to, um, you know, still talk about my other receiver question, um, but let's let that one go. The NSF has recently funded a center on spectrum sharing. Do you have any comments on what issues they might be addressing and how that could impact policy? Uh, I'm in, involved or touch upon a lot of those. I'm involved with something called Spectrum X, which is an NSF funded uh, uh, project where uh, some of the things we'll be looking about uh, at is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, receiver receiver performance. So I don't have the specifics in my mind immediately, but uh, the general 
answer is is yes. Okay. What what could you imagine as a solution for protection against the interference for those GPS signals? Well, uh, over time, of course. Uh, well, I mean, we were talking about jamming and spoofing. I don't see what protection you can get. We're we're talking about. I think as uh, as we heard this morning, we're we're we're, we're talking about something that's out there stationary and uh, or uh, I mean, it's something out in space that one can uh, that one can jam, and uh, therefore uh, we can't uh, we can't uh, we can't rely on it, and uh, so we may have to change to a different system because of the GPS interference. So, um, Margaret, uh, we have about two minutes left. Okay. I see that. I love that question that just popped up, by the way. I cheated and looked at it. I think it was from Mike. <laughs> well, no, it's not cheating. I'm here to help you <laughs> read all those. Um, that's the, the FCT tests very little and just accepts the manufacturer's selected lab tests. Yeah, that is uh, so something, in my opinion, that really needs to be uh, looked at. Uh, a lot of that happened when I ran OET when some of these uh, things occurred. But uh, one of the things that regulators do, they tend to put rules in place, but then they don't go back and check often enough to see if those rules are actually working. So some sort of program of pulling receivers in, for example, or pulling transmitters in on a regular basis to make sure that the labs are being honest and so forth, I think is something that uh, it should be considered here driven by the fact that we've got all this pressure to use the spectrum more intensely. And we got to start doing things like that to make sure people are playing by the rules. That's the reason I'm focusing a lot of my attention on enforcement issues. One more, Margaret. One more. Um, let's see what other good ones we have out here. Uh, GPS. What is the general difference be between frequency allocations from commercial world, FCC, and the military world, NTIA? Well, the, as I indicated, the spectrum is, uh, is divided up between those that are exclusively one, exclusively the other, or, sh or, or shared. When you ask about the differences, of course, how they're managed, you don't get a license uh, on the... Uh, on the NTI side, you get a license on the FCC side, for example, you get an authorization on, on the NTI side. So I'm not quite sure I understand the, uh, I'm not sure uh, quite understand. That would be a long, that could be a very long, uh, having served at both NTI and the FCC, that could be a very long, uh, interesting uh, uh, discussion. Um, <clears throat> I think we need to uh, end it on that note, uh, Dale. How can uh, people get a hold of you if they have other questions? Uh, yeah, I'd love uh, I'd love feedback. Uh, my uh, email address is uh, uh, is uh, dale dale dot hatfield at colorado dot edu. Dale dot hatfield at colorado dot edu. Great, thank you so much, Dale.